Hello, and welcome to the Euro What, episode 35 for the week of January 21st, 2019. I'm Ben Smith, and I'm joined today by Mike McComb. Hey, Mike. Hello. We are a bunch of Americans trying to make sense of the Eurovision Song Contest, and this week we'll be talking about the latest wave of selection news. And oh boy, there is a lot of it. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's just been a flood from this yes. past weekend. And yes. kind of unexpected. A lot of almost surprise announcements, I guess. Yeah, but... I mean, yeah, like it has, it's definitely been a flood. And just to bring this into like a weird Boston thing, uh, it's currently the, the 100th anniversary of the molasses flood here in Boston, which sounds very funny, uh, but actually did affect like about 20 people. And it was very fast. And it led to better industrial storage standards. So there you go. Oh, all right. Yeah, I mean, when you say molasses flood, like, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is that scene in Volcano where the guy is just standing there watching the lava come towards him. And then Mm -hmm. he's in the lava and then he's dead. Mm -hmm. I I will have to look that up. uh, But but yeah, we are are dealing with a a molasses flood of sudden announcements this week, it feels like. Mm -hmm. I guess the flood got started. I want to say 15 minutes after we finished recording last week's episode. Yep. In typical fashion, we are instantly obsolete when I leave the room that I use as my studio and check my RSS to be like, oh, let me just see like what's on Jezebel or whatever and see that there's some Eurovision news. It's like, why is there Eurovision news? It's four in the morning in Europe. And yeah, Belgium announced that Elliot Vassamillet will be their representative. I just like that, like, at this point, it's just comical that, like, 15 minutes after we're done, it's like, oh, cool, new news. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there is probably news breaking as we speak, uh, so that'll be exciting. But that's, that's, It's great, but yeah, no, like, this is, I mean, it sounds like he's got the, the usual pedigree for this sort of thing. He competed on The Voice. Mm-hmm. I like how Belgium does their, their internal selection process since they have a few different national broadcasters where it's just like, okay, we'll just take turns. I mean, it seems to be working really well for them. Uh, yeah, this this year, it's the Walloon broadcaster that gets to select, and they're, they're the ones who actually broadcast The Voice uh, in Belgium. And their last couple of entrants have been voice alumni. Mm-hmm. The song's going to be written by Pierre Dumoulin. He wrote City Lights for Blanche in 2017, and that worked well for her. And I think that song would still work today. So I'm very eager to hear what what yeah, City which... Lights 2019 is going to be. <laughs> also in the news, Spain selected their entrant this weekend. They have selected Mickey and Lavenda. I really like this song. I like this one so much. It oh. is it's charming and it like I have no clue what's going on in it and for all I know the lyrical content could just be terrible but I dig it and like it it, it again it feels like it has energy. Yeah. I I mean this this just feels so different from what Spain has sent I think the entire time I've been watching the, Yeah, like most of the time I've been watching <laughs> Like, I think we described it last week as what they usually send or what they have sent many a time has just felt like Chili's music. Yeah, or, I don't know, just like kind of forced party or Mm -hmm. finding a category or genre of song and just trying to be the ultimate in that genre. And it's like, no, just just send a pop song. Send a pop song. Yeah, just send send a pop song and just like a nice one and that would be fine. Yeah, and just the way that the public vote played out for this was really kind of fascinating to me. Uh, so like as a reminder of how Spain did their selection this year, uh, they had their contestants from uh, Operation Triunfo put together 17 different entries. Three of them were voted on by the public to go to the national final, and then seven of them were selected by the producers, uh, so 10 of the 17. And uh, La Venda was not one of the ones chosen by the public. Uh, so uh, it was I don't know, kind of coming in at a slight disadvantage, I would say, since okay. this was all decided by public vote. After the performances, like this solidly won. It got uh, a third of the public vote, which, I mean, when you consider that there are 10 entries, that's that's a pretty good plurality that's to a good have. Chunk. Yeah. Uh, second place had 22%. Third place had 14%. But then everybody else was like, 7% or less. So, And it feels kind of 
weirdly early in the season for one of the big nations to have picked their entry. I don't know, maybe? The calendar just keeps shifting every mm-hmm. year. Like it, it, it feels like countries are realizing that they should probably choose a little bit closer to the submission deadline just so that they can see what other people are doing. But eventually somebody's got to choose first. And, somebody has to be uh, first. Yeah. Somebody other have... than Albania, that is. <laughs> yeah. And like, on the other hand, you have all these other events that become part of the Eurovision season. You have Eurovision in concert. You have all of these other places where your entry can pop up and be a special guest and you mm-hmm. can promote it. So it makes sense that that if you promote, if you put that earlier, you have that song in people's heads earlier, right? And it gives you a chance to like make changes if mm-hmm. changes are needed. Like they're, uh, they've already decided that they're probably going to do a little bit of revamping for Lavenda. I hope they don't do too much tinkering. Like that, that's yeah. always the risk. Where it's just like, oh, I'm just going to fix this and fix this, and it's just gets kind of overproduced. Yeah, like I, I was actively concerned when I saw that they are considering revamping because I'm like, it's very good now. I'm actually excited for Spain. Yeah. So <laughs> good, good, good job, Spain. Uh, good job, Spain. Uh, look, you did looking it. forward to this. And yeah, I'm wondering if maybe this year's Eurovision is just going to be one where I'm just going to be like super optimistic about every entry because so far we're two for two, and mm-hmm. I don't know what my top two are yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, the the videos have started. Yes, folks. Yes. The videos have started, and you can go onto YouTube and watch about 20 different people tell you what their top two Eurovision entries of this year are. Uh, how do you make that choice? Uh, Guys, anyway. it, we, we have two entries. Like, yeah. Wait until you have more than a handful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now would also be a good time to say that we don't really have a YouTube channel, so who are we to judge? Yes. But, uh... <laughs> that said, please like and subscribe. Absolutely. Also announcing an artist today was San Marino. Uh, so a lot of hype about this one. Could it be the human Ken doll? Could it be Suri? Could it be Cher? It is none of those people. <laughs> none of those. Yeah. I would like to apologize right now just for making an offhand joke last week that it could be Sir Hot. He's probably international somehow because he's Turkish. And as it turns out, yes, it's Sir Hot. If you're not familiar with Sir Hot, he represented San Marino in 2016 uh, with the song I Didn't Know. And we did mention that song last year, uh, back in episode 19, I want to say, because there was a version of that song that he did with Martha Wash that became a minor dance club hit for whatever reason. For, for reasons that, that are still unclear to me. More and more each day. I've got to say I'm addicted. The sail together through the skies. Your eyes never told me lies. No, no. I didn't know that I'm falling for you. And my dreams could come true. I didn't know that you were like the sun. Our life has just begun. I didn't know. It peaked at number 25 on the dance club chart. I was refreshing my knowledge of who Sir Hot was and Mm -hmm. what his background was, which, fun fact, he hosted Turkish Jeopardy. Really? Yes. So he's basically the Alex Trebek of the contest. Here for it. Yeah. (laughs) In addition to that, just reading the paragraph or so explaining how well the song did on the dance chart, it's really trying to play up that he placed on the U.S. dance chart. Yeah, he was 25, which not not bad. I I would be happy with a number 25. That's currently better than I've done on the the Billboard U.S. dance chart. And he was on the chart for like seven or eight weeks. Like he he was on there for a while. So uh, good Good for for him. him. And... I got to say, like, at first, I was a little disappointed with the news, just be like, oh, they were, San Marino was just playing this up so much, and really thought that they had some sort of secret in their back pocket. But the more that I think about this, it's just like, well, if he has a song where he's actually singing, I think that was my issue with I Didn't Know, where it was just like him kind of intoning and, uh, and, and there was that first version of the video where he looked like a Bond villain trying to seduce something it, i don't it, know yeah, like it was <laughs> yeah like it was it was very rex harrison yes yes and uh i, I think that just kind of set the wrong vibe where if the final version were what was initially released probably would have been more receptive to it but yeah i mean if it's if it's a better produced song or at least makes a better first impression san marino could have something here it, it, it seems like twitter was really excited about the sir hot announcement so 
again, I'm optimistic yeah. about it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Your vision's catching me on a good day. Yeah, just, so. <laughs> just whatever, guys. Do what you want, San Marino. I guess in terms of a surprise announcement, Netherlands revealed who their artist is going to be. Singer-songwriter Duncan Lawrence. He's 24. He studied in Stockholm and London while he was in school. He used to go by the name Duncan Demore, and he was a contestant on The Voice of Holland in 2014. Uh, which is kind of the Eurovision nucleus for Netherlands, it seems. <laughs> he was on Ilsa de Lange's team. She was one half of the Common Lynettes, who represented Netherlands in 2014. He made it to the semi-final clash round. Mm-hmm. Which, I had to look up which, what as, that as was. As a person yeah. who does not watch The Voice, and well, or at least has not watched it since the first season, and definitely does not understand the various hoops they have added now. Yeah. When you look at the top of the Wikipedia page for it, it's like, oh, he was eliminated in the Clash round. It's like, oh, that's the battle round. And it's looking, oh, wait, no, that's something different. Oh, he... Oh, he was a semifinalist? Like, that that just kind of frames it differently. Like, I thought he was eliminated first out of 52 people or something. It's like, oh, no, he he made it pretty far. And that was the same season that Ogeen, mm-hmm. who represented Netherlands in 2017, they won that season. So, yeah, there's just a lot going on with Voice of Holland. And it sounds like Netherlands is super enthusiastic about this guy. Yeah, like, just reading the the comments from their selection committee rep eric von stada uh we were blown away by this song it was so powerful that we have unanimously decided that duncan is our man like that that just sounds like they were in the process of reviewing entries as the internal selection committee were like nope this one Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which like that that's actually a real good way to build hype like just getting something like that and on one hand it, it feels like a very cynical sort of tim gunn saying this is the best season of project runway he's ever seen sort of a thing Mm mm-hmm which is like, okay, but it's like season 19. Yeah, but I mean, saying that you've unanimously decided yeah. that somebody is going to be the rep, like that that carries a little, like it's not puffery. It's real tough to get a committee of, of, of X number of people to agree to like one thing unanimously. So something's up. So I, I'm, I'm interested. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think. Ever since Netherlands chose a nuke, like they've really solidified what their strategy is and they've only had like one or two missteps along the way Mm -hmm. and uh listening to some of his videos on instagram and watching a couple of his videos on youtube like he definitely has a voice so if if there's a song that matches it again super enthusiastic about netherlands like (laughs) your vision 2019 is starting to look really nice you guys so (laughs) 2019 we're excited we dare to dream so much happening today and then so much happening uh this coming weekend like we we are in the early stages of selection season and it's just kind of going uphill yeah, so from see, here. We're, we're on the we are on the big hill of the roller coaster watching it kind of click up mm-hmm. the big event happening this weekend is going to be france's mm-hmm. final yeah how was some how was semi-final too um ooh, there was there was a lot that was going on so netta opened the show with toy still waiting for her new single which uh should be dropping in a couple weeks after her performance and when they were kind of doing the parade of contestants uh to start off the show uh, some bds protesters jumped the stage and i actually missed that whole moment uh like i they did a really quick job of getting them off the stage i guess but it was still kind of overlapping with the end of the first heat of hungary's selection process Mm -hmm. and so i was kind of watching two screens at once and not really paying full attention to either one of them and yeah i think my eyes were uh, focused on hungary as the protesters were on stage so that happened and i think that may have put a, a couple of the early contestants on edge and possibly interfered with their performance and that they may not have been able to give a hundred percent performance mm-hmm. there were also the sound problems that were happening in the first semifinal seemed to kind of continue we, we were talking before we started recording about how it the studio might not be set up acoustically for all of the Mm in-audience action that is happening in some of these performances. And yeah, they're just having a very difficult time figuring out which mic to have turned on at Mm -hmm. points. Well, and I I think about it in terms of something like Saturday Night Live, and I feel like every episode Mm -hmm. you have people complaining on Twitter about how terrible their favorite band sounds. And it's about realizing that you're in Studio 8H, which is not necessarily built as sort of a live musical performance space. It's built as a, a sort of a workhorse for all of the various things that happen at SNL. Mm-hmm. So it's as much about and you know the audio engineering going into the miking and knowing how to properly mic things and how to properly set up that sound design for the main band stage during their performances. And sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. It really just varies from band to band. Yeah, and I and I think also there's just some aspects of the performances that 
maybe playing better live in studio mm-hmm. than it is through TV. Like the panel of experts that they have sort of evaluating the performances without actually giving points. They all thought that Gabriella, who gave the first performance, they, they were unanimous on which four they wanted to see go to the final. And they were just, they all said that she should be one of them. And I thought her performance was terrible. And I, I know that sounds really harsh, but one, like I think she was thrown off by the stage invasion. Two, I don't think her song was that great. It's just really, it's a hook, sort of, that is just repeated for about two thirds of the song. And it was a very colorful performance. And I think visually it was really engaging, but it just did not play well on TV. And yeah, like she she did not advance. Overall, I thought the, the second semifinal was, I think it was on par with the first semifinal. Like I, I don't disagree with the four entries that moved on. Mm-hmm. And I think the eight entries that have made up the final are the correct eight entries uh, from from this year's field. Okay. Yeah, and I'm, I'm excited to see how this one turns out because there's been – it's been some interesting stuff, which uh, sort of like how you we were saying earlier in this episode about Spain. It's very exciting for me to go, I'm actually interested to see what the French entry is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, it seems like there are – three front runners in this year's competition. The main front runner is probably Bilal Hassani mm-hmm. with his song uh, I never know how to pronounce this and this is going to expose just how bad my French is. Uh, wa? I'm not rich but I'm shining bright I can't see my kingdom So this is a song that is uh, written by Meta Monsieur, and I'm I'm hoping that the two week break between shows have allowed for improving on the performance. I thought that was the part that was most lacking in in his semifinal, where it was just there are all these elements on stage that you can kind of see where they're going, but they're not quite there yet. And yeah, kind of more of a B plus A minus performance, and with a little bit of work and maybe a little bit of editing, it could it could easily be an A performance. Okay, and he's had a couple of weeks to think about that. So mm-hmm. he won both the jury vote and the public vote in the first semifinal. Mm-hmm. So I am guessing he is going to be the one to beat at this point, uh, winning the jury vote and actually sweeping the jury vote in the second semifinal was Simone with the song "Tous les deux." Okay. Chante, chante si tu veux, chante quand tu peux, mais chante avec moi. Did you get a chance to see any of the performances from the second semifinal? I have not caught up on France semifinal two yet. Okay. So this one, I think it was probably the strongest vocal of the night. The actual stage performance, I liked most of it, but it felt kind of like an Adele impersonation in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Particularly, there's this video screen behind her where it's her singing and she's in black and white. And it's just like, ooh, that element, like it's, it's not that it's Mm self-indulgent. It's just like, that's just a visual component that I, I found distracting and just kind of unnecessary. And my husband, Dave, was also watching the uh, performance. And he's like, yeah, she needs to lose about 50% of the papas in the song <laughs> at the end, which kind of agree with that. But if, if she takes out 50%, the song's probably going to be like a minute shorter. And yeah, but <laughs> I don't see that change happening. I think everybody was expecting her to win the public vote as well and really have it be kind of like a tete-a-tete with Bilal uh, in the first semifinal. But the public vote actually went to Emmanuel Moir with the song La Promesse. Mm-hmm.
I think this was the performance and song that I ended up liking the most out of the field. Like it, it, it felt the most fully realized. My issue was with the karaoke round, <laughs> and he was doing a piano version of Aha's "Take on Me," and he keyed it in such a way where rather than going up at the chorus, he was going down. So. No, yeah, no, like, like you. Th- th- yeah, like, there was no high if, note, if like were, no attempt at the high note. If you were selecting Aha's take on me, you were saying, I am going to attempt the high note, even if I know that in my heart of hearts, I cannot reach it. And I knew almost instantly that he was not going to hit that note because, like, since he was taking it downward, like, he was starting from a higher spot. And he was kind of struggling or cracking at a couple of those notes. I don't know if he just got kicked off wrong or if that was an intentional part of the performance. But yeah, just the way that his voice was cracking there, it's like, oh, this high note's not going to go well. And then like it didn't even happen. And my immediate reaction was like, that's cheating. Yeah. Hopefully he will be doing something different for uh, the... Uh, Actually, I wonder if they're going to do it the same way that they did last year, where instead of the karaoke round, it's the I'm going to be the backup singer for somebody way more famous round. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Which, <laughs> uh, yeah, like where like the Gypsy Kings mm-hmm. randomly show mm-hmm. up or, yeah, I, I I don't know what their plans are for the final, but. But we shall see. Uh, the only other major change that we're aware of is that uh, Sylvain Oreg, who did the song. Le Petit Nicolas? Yes. Uh, can't call his song that anymore. Right. I did read this news story about that because I was like, oh, that was, that had like a very intriguing performance. What's going on with that? Mm-hmm. Uh, and as it turns out, he borrowed that name from a series of books uh, that the song is clearly pointing to, very obviously, as it turns out. Though not so obviously for a yeah yeah as, for, for me uh. sitting at home, uh, <laughs> having to explain to my roommate that no, I don't actually understand anything that these people are saying during the non-song portions. Mm-hmm. I just like that a the the estate of the the authors of that book series were like, no, you can't call your song that. That's a that's a registered property that we are we we get money from. I just like that his response was something like, long, after the rightful owners misinterpreted our little well-meant and affectionate wink, which we tried to make. You got caught. You got caught, dude. It'll be interesting if the estate of Aretha Franklin will be going after uh, the divas for their uh, La Voix uh, de Rita, which is owed to Aretha Franklin, which actually turned out so much better than I was expecting. I thought it was going to be super campy, but... Yeah, it was kind of Dreamgirls-esque, okay. uh, much like Sylvan's song, which I thought was just like, wow, this is the most French thing I've seen in quite a while. It should probably go through. The Divas were kind of that for semifinal two. And it was just like, yeah, they should go through. And and they did. So they will, they will be performing in Saturday's final. So Saturday's show should be a pretty good one. Nice. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. Let's see, elsewhere in this weekend, Georgia is down to 10 singers in, in their property. And just to check in on this, Mike, how many entrances mm-hmm. Lithuania still have? Oh, uh, let's see. <laughs> they were at 49, then they added three. They've lost 13. Carry the four. I think there are 39 who are still technically in the competition. Although Heat 3 is already filmed and heat four doesn't air for a couple weeks so okay. yeah your guess is as good okay as so sort of a schrodinger's cat situation right now where there either <laughs> mm-hmm. are or aren't 39 entries in lithuania good to know yeah we might actually be in the lithuanian competition at this point okay i need to check my email so <laughs> sort of like a jury summons okay latvia's supernova they are having semifinal one this coming weekend which is exciting since that's that's one of the ones where I am surprised at how many of the entries I like from that country. Mm-hmm. Uh, but all the entries are now available on Spotify. Yeah, they did a really good job of making those uh, entries available pretty early on. You can get to all of those on our Spotify playlist. Malta X Factor will be having their finale. This this weekend, as we predicted, was a bloodbath. Uh, they started with eight acts. They are now down to four. And whoever survives the finale uh, will be the act representing Malta at Eurovision. We won't know their song. That will be coming later. But uh, apparently X Factor has been successful because it got renewed for a second season. It's not clear if the second season is all going to be choosing for Eurovision 2020, but congrats on finding something successful, Malta. So <laughs> You did it. Yay. Uh, Yay. Let's see. Elsewhere, Romania. Romania is having semifinal one. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then uh, next Monday, we will have semifinal allocation results. Oof. 
that's going to be so helpful in so many ways. We'll we'll finally have some structure to this sort of freewheeling Eurovision 2019 season. We're going to get to put so many index cards on the on the digital board that organizes our episodes and as process nerds this makes us happy. That's going to do it for this episode of the Euro What. Thanks for listening. The Euro What podcast is hosted by Ben Smith, that's me, and Mike McComb. That's me. You can find us on our website at eurowhat.com and on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at eurowhat. If you'd like to contact us by email, we can be reached at esc at whatelseison.tv. We'd love to hear your questions and comments. You can also subscribe to Eurowhat on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or the podcast app of your choice. Rating and reviewing the podcast when you subscribe also helps other Eurovision fans find us. Word of mouth is still the best way to get folks to listen, so please be sure to tell your friends about the Eurowhat podcast. We'll be back next week to try and make sense of what's new in Eurovision. 